So um, this session, I'm going to talk to you about a more recent tool, and this is called CREMA for CIS Regulatory Element Motif Activities. All right. So what is CREMA about? Uh, in a sense, CREMA is about um, distal regulation. So as you know, in higher eukaryotes, a lot of the gene regulation is not implemented uh, by binding sites at the promoter, but in fact is implemented by binding sites that are at the distal cis regulatory elements uh, that can be up to hundreds of kilobases away from the promoter. And, um, and so any kind of more complete model of gene regulation would have to take this distal regulation into account. Um, so what are these distal cis regulatory elements? So basically, these are small chunks of DNA, typically a few hundred base pairs long, where, which get activated uh, by binding of transcription factors and the uh, simultaneously opening of the chromatin in these regions. Each of these CREs is bound by different combinations of transcription factors. And typically, once these CREs become active and groups of transcription factors are binding to them, uh, they will also re recruit the RNA polymerase. And the RNA polymerase can even try to start transcription from, uh, from these uh, enhancers or cis regulatory elements. But often, uh, these make only abortive transcripts, so you get short transcripts generated from these CREs. And then what's happening is that uh, in some way, through various processes that we're slowly starting to understand and might even uh, include active processes by which sort of loops of DNA are extruded by, by motors that bind to the DNA, um, these distal regulatory elements and uh, promoters that they regulate, they come together in space, right? So the genome folds up in 3D and they come together and then basically the polymerase can be transferred from the regulatory element onto the promoter and lead to the uh, activation of transcription. And uh, the, so the, the cis, active cis, uh, cis regulatory elements are characterized not only by local opening of the chromatin, but they're also characterized typically by particular modifications that are made to the histones of the nucleosomes near these cis regulatory elements. All right, so why is it so hard to include the effects of the distal regulation into the kind of models that I've been, been talking about uh, in the previous session? Well, the first challenge is that there are simply too many of them, okay? So it actually screens that have been done by a number of labs. So, so for example, the lab of Alexander Stark in Vienna has did, done this where you sort of start just screening randomly pieces of genome put it in front of reporters and say, can this piece of genome act as a regulatory element? And it turns out that actually a substantial fraction of the genome can act as a cis regulatory element in some condition, okay? So there are many, 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 many of them. Uh, and they are highly condition dependent, right? So a gene is always a gene and it's always in the same place in the genome. And a promoter of a gene is always a promoter and it's always in the same place of the genome. But where the cis regulatory elements are that are active in a particular condition changes enormously from condition to condition. Okay, so it's a very condition dependent thing. You cannot make once a, a list of where are all the cis regulatory elements because you would get way too many and the vast majority of them would be inactive in any condition. So it, it's context dependent. Um, and then, you know, finding these cis regulatory elements is also still uh, like not a solved problem, right? So there are, there are various methods that people use to find these distal cis regulatory elements. You can either just look by DNA accessibility. So these are uh, methods like DNA seq or attack seq, uh, find these sort of open chromatin regions. But there are also other histone marks that are marks of enhancer. So the um, H3K4 monomethylation. So this is a met monomethylation of, of lysine number four on histone three is a mark of uh, enhancers. The um, 
acetylation of lysine 27 on histone 3 is considered to be a mark of active enhancers. The binding of the general cofactor P300 is also considered to be a mark of enhancers. Um, these, these small abortive transcripts that you can capture when you sequence deep enough are also considered uh, a mark of enhancers. But all these various genome-wide screens don't give you the same answer. Okay, so even if you do them in the same cell type, uh, the list of enhancers that you or cis regulatory elements that you get from these these screens are, might give you different, different answers. And then finally, if you want to, it's especially difficult to model the effect of the activity of enhancers on the expression of promoters because we understand very little about how the interactions between CREs and target promoters is established or how strong they are or how much the, uh, the expression is going to be affected uh, by each, um, of each promoter by each CRE. And so it's very difficult to make a model of the, the effect of these enhancers. All right, so what I'm going to tell you about is our first attempt to take into account uh, this distal regulation or to sort of learn something about this, this distal regulation by the CREs. And we're not going to at all try to um, model the effects of the CREs on expression. We're going to focus completely on explaining how the activity of these CREs uh, is changing uh, across samples and model this in terms of, again, predicted regulatory size. All right. So this is called CREMA for cis regulatory element motif activities. And we're basically modeling local chromatin state in terms of predicted concentrations of regulatory sites. And this, uh, this method was mainly the work, PhD work of uh, Ahmed Kramer in our lab. And so as input, it takes raw sequencing data of, of markers of enhancer of some type. So this can be chromatin accessibility data like DNA-seq or ATAC-seq, or it could be chipset data of chromatin marks that are marks of enhancers like H3K27 acetylation or H3K4 monomethylation. And so we take data of this across a set of samples. And then essentially what we're going to do is we're going to find all the CREs in that data set. So we're going to find all genomic regions that show enrichment of these marks in at least one of the samples. So that looks as, as regions that act as a CRE in at least one of the samples. Then we're going to um, quantify each CRE, how active is it in each sample from, from this data. We're going to predict binding sites for transcription factors within each of these cis regulatory elements. And then we're going to finally use the same kind of model as we use for MARA to model the activity of these cis regulatory elements across the samples in terms of these predicted binding sites. Okay, so I will now take you through all the steps. So the first step is taking the raw sequencing data and use it to detect all the CREs in each sample genome wide. Okay. So for this, we use a previously developed tool in the lab, which is a general automated pipeline for chipset processing, which we call Crunch. And so there's a website, crunch.univas.ch, and this is just a general tool for the processing of chipset data. And many steps used by this tool are used also in CREMA to, to first process the data. And so I will explain these to you by explaining you uh, the steps in this crunch pipeline. So this was uh, published a few years ago in, uh, in genome research. All right, so this is an overview of all the, the steps of the crunch analysis. And so I will sort of go quickly through what is in these steps. So um, first thing, when we get the raw sequencing reads, uh, we need to do some quality control on this data. So these are just very standard things that we do. So we truncate bad quality three prime ends of reads. We remove reads that are too short. 
have too low sequence equality, have too many undetermined letters, or that are sometimes you get reads that are just A-A-A-A-A or A-C-A-C-A-C-A-C. -A -C -A -C -A -C. So the um, reads that have low dinucleotide entropy are also moved. And uh, then also sometimes when data is uploaded, there are still sort of the adapters from the sequencing still attached to them. And so we also have part of the pipeline where we look for remaining adapter sequences and remove them. After that, uh, all the reads are mapped to the genome. Uh, we use bowtie for this. We only use the best possible mappings for each read. And when there are multiple equal quality mappings for a read, uh, we basically uniformly distribute the weight of the read to multiple places. All right. Um, then typically, um, in all these uh, chipsec data, or also our TACSEQ or DNA seq, you basically get, you sequence only one end of a fragment that was in your solution. And if you have paired end sequencing, where you've sequenced both ends of the fragment, of course, you know exactly where the fragment starts and ends. And so then we will use that information and we know exactly the fragment starts and ends. But in many cases, people upload data where only one end of the fragment has been sequenced. And so then we don't know how long the fragment was uh, that we sequenced one end of. And we somehow have to infer what was the typical length of fragments in the input data. Okay, so... Uh, in uh, sort of 2007, uh, Christoph Schmidt and, and Philip Bücher were the, were the first to, to sort of show that you can kind of um, estimate fragment lengths in chiptech data from correlations in the density of fragments on the positive and negative thread. So basically the idea is that if you have fragments of let's say 200 base pairs long, and there is some area in the genome that is highly enriched. So you get lots of fragments of size 200 from this area. Then you're gonna get that half of them will be sequenced from this end and half of them will be sequenced from the other end. And so you're gonna get sort of two neighboring peaks on the genome, one on the positive end and one shifted by the fragment length on the negative side of the DNA, all right? And so, Basically, you can detect the fragment length by looking for correlations between the density on the plus and the negative strand with a certain particular shift, okay? And so there's gonna be the highest correlation between density of the positive and negative end at a distance which corresponds to the typical fragment length. And so when we have, um, when we have uh, single end uh, uh, data, so not paired end, but only from one end, we use such a correlation function, right? So we, for a distance D, we take the correlation between the number of reads on the positive side and the negative side, negative strand shifted by D, and we look at what this shift D, this correlation is maximal, and we use this as the estimated fragment length. All right. Okay. So from this, we end up with basically a measure for each sample along the genome of at every position in the genome, how many fragments overlap this position in the genome, what is the sum of the number of fragments. And now we need to use that data to find uh, regions in the genome that are enriched, where there is a sort of surprisingly high density of fragments. And the way we do this is, you know, basic idea is similar to many approaches for finding chipset peaks is um, you go with a sliding window along the genome. So by default, we use a sliding window of size 500 and we shift it by 250 at a time. And then basically we compare the density of, of um, fragments in, um, in a foreground sample that has been chipped versus some input DNA sample that should in principle be uniform on the DNA. And then uh, we collect all the windows 
that are over some significant threshold for enrichment. And then afterwards, we fuse overlapping windows into regions that are enhanced. So I want to say one or two things about um, how we do, what statistical model we, we use to find these enriched regions, because I think this is one area where we're kind of sort of different from most approaches and uh, it's important. Ah, I forgot. Before I get to that, so um, it turns out that even in a background sample, okay, which is just random input DNA and so should not show any enrichment, there are some regions that have a much higher density of fragments than others. So I'm showing you here a reverse cumulative distribution of how many windows are there along the genome where in a background sample, this is just from some example data set, there are more than so many reads mapping. And so you see that, uh, okay, so these are windows where there are zero. And so here is about 10. So it's only, so I went from 10 to the seven to 10 to the six windows, right? So it says, only 10% of all windows have more than 10 reads. 1% have more than whatever, 17 reads. And uh, 20 some reads, only one in a thousand windows have more than so many reads. So it becomes very rare. But then there is a very long tail and you have even, you know, regions that have more than a hundred and, and even many more uh, reads mapping to them. So even in the background, there are some windows in the genome where there's a very large number of reads mapping, okay? If you look into those regions, you find this is often repetitive DNA that poorly maps to other uh, organisms. And uh, it's hard to find autologous regions in other organisms. And we strongly suspect that the high density of reads in the background in these windows is an artifact of the fact that the, the genome from which you're getting the data and the assembly of the genome that you're mapping to, the sequence that you're mapping to are not the same. So for example, in your genome that you're sampling from, this repeat occurs a hundred times, whereas in your assembly, it only occurs 10 times. And so now all the reads from these repeat map to this region and we will have 10 times as many reads mapping to them, okay? So these background regions with high read density, they are a problem for all the kind of statistical analysis of enrichment. And so since it's a very small fraction of the genome, we remove these uh, from consideration. It's actually, so, okay, so this may sound like a very technical detail, but I want to uh, impress on you that actually taking care of these kind of details is really what is the crucial difference between getting results that are in the end so polluted by artifacts that you cannot trust them and the results that you can rely on. So doing these kind of things actually is really important, even though it's a stupid technical detail. All right, so now the key uh, thing is what, how are we going to, when we compare the number of reads we get in, a, in, in the chip sample versus the number of reads that we get in the background, how do we actually quantify the significance of the enrichment? And so if we, we use a statistical model for this that was first uh, developed in this uh, paper in 2000 noise, uh, 2000 noise, 2009. And um, this is, uh, we're using a model of multiplicative noise for a log normal uh, distribution and for sound sampling noise. So it works as follows. So let's say we're looking at one window and in the chip or foreground sample, we find little n reads, whereas the total number of reads in the foreground sample is capital N. So the fraction of reads that map to this window is little n over n, and we take the logarithm of this. And now we also have a background or an input DNA sample and in this background sample, little m out of a total of capital M map to this region. We also take the log. And so this is the, the log fold change of read density in the foreground minus the background. Okay. Now we assume that for regions that are not enriched, okay, so that, that, that don't really have a true enrichment, this variable x 
should follow a distribution that is the convolution of a log normal and Poisson sampling. And it turns out that you can model this well by a, a log normal distribution, so a normal distribution in X, with a variance that is the sum of some variance that is coming from noise in the, in the measurement process due to PCR amplification, shearing of the DNA, cutting of the DNA, efficiency of the, of the chip, and so on. That is a, a value sigma squared, plus uh, noise that is coming from the sampling, and the, the variance of that is 1 over n plus 1 over n. Okay, so that's the statistical model we used. And then what we do is we fit a mixture model across the entire genome, so we're using all the windows, all the x's in each window, we're fitting the mu of this distribution and the sigma squared. And we're assuming that the, our data is now a mixture of a fraction rho of the windows are not enriched. And so their x values come from this background distribution plus a fraction one minus rho are truly enriched. And we take their x values to come from some uniform distribution with some bounds between the, the largest and smallest x, okay? And then we fit mu, sigma, and rho to maximize the likelihood of the entire data set across the genome. And then we can use that to now go into individual windows and calculate a probability that this window is truly enriched. All right, so the way we do that, we quantify this with a z-score, which is so, it's the log fold change in density minus this average log fold change mu divided by the variance for this window. And that, of course, depends on the absolute counts for this window. And so if there were no enriched windows in the genome at all, then this z-scores should just follow a simple Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance one. And so in, in a log scale, that would be a parabola. This is this red curve. This is a simple, par uh, a simple parabola. But the actual distribution we see is this black curve. And so we see that most windows in the genome indeed follow precisely this distribution. But there is a subset of windows here where the z-scores are much higher. Okay? These are the windows that are truly enriched. And uh, the way we now pick a, a cutoff is we pick a cutoff on this uh, distribution such that the average posterior probability for the windows to be truly enriched is 90%. Okay, so we set a cutoff where we predict that at least 90% of the windows that we predict are truly enriched. Um, I'm showing this uh, to show you that with this statistical model, we, we really see that the kind of fluctuations in read densities between foreground and background really do fit our statistical model. And uh, I think this is noteworthy because almost all, um, all other uh, peak finders for Chipsec that I'm aware of, uh, the, the distributions that they assume do not fit the distributions you actually see in the data. So I think the model we use is the only one that actually fits um, the data that you see. <clears throat> all right, so then we found all the enriched regions. And now you still often find that a, a region, uh, if you look carefully at the density of reads in this region, so here's, here's one example of a region that was 1 kb long, where all the 500 base pair regions in this 1 kb were, were enriched. But if you look in the red curve here is the sort of the actual density of reads along this one kilo base, it clearly looks like there are two separate groups. Okay? So there is a final step where we go in every enriched region, look at this red curve and fit this red curve to a mixture of Gaussian peaks where the width of this Gaussian peak is really kind of determined by the fragment size that we've estimated. Previously, because when you have a particular peak, you expect to get uh, a Gaussian shaped peak of a certain group. And so we, we basically, in this way, decompose all the enriched regions into individual binary peaks. 
And then we also finally, we, we annotate these peaks by finding the nearest gene to the so on. So, so the output of this uh, crunch analysis is that you get lists of uh, peaks with a z-score for each peak. Where is the nearest gene on one side? Where is the nearest gene on the other side? And so on and so on and so on. Okay. So all you need to know for, the, for understanding CREMA is that all these steps of the pipeline are run on the raw input data so that we now get at the end for each sample, we get a list of all the CREs that occur in that sample, all the peaks that occur in that sample. All right. So after this, so basically here's a cartoon of this situation. So in each sample, one sample at a time, we ran crunch and we fought, found all binding peaks. So here we found one binding peak in this region. In the second sample, we found a peak here, there, 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 and there. In the third sample, we found a peak there and there. So we now for each sample, we have a, have a list of these peaks. And then we basically now cluster all the peaks from all samples whose centers are within 75 base pairs of each other. So again, we're using this 150 base pairs that is the size of one uh, nucleosome three region. As, uh, as, a, as, a, as a distance measure to cluster things together that sit essentially under the same nucleosome. And these are fused together. And so in this particular example, here would be one CRE, these three peaks would be the second CRE, these five peaks from the different samples would be the third CRE. And so we end up with a list of, of CREs that are all the regions that had significant either openness or the mark, depending on what kind of data it is, in one of the samples. And so we find that if we do this, that typically more than 90% of the CREs have a length that is less than 500 base pairs, which is consistent with how thick we, we think CREs should be. And typically you get on the order of maybe up to 100,000 CREs in a given data set. Okay, so that's the number. So by the way, that's quite a bit more than the number of active promoters, right? So in a typical sample, you maybe have 10,000 active genes, so you have 10,000 active promoters. You can have an order of magnitude more series that you detect in the genome. Okay, next step, we wanna assign a signal strength to each CRE across the sample. So we wanna basically say, how active does this CRE appear to be in each of the samples? So the signal matrix for each CRE C and each sample S assigns a number. And the number is actually, it's relatively simple. We take how many reads were mapped to this CRE in the foreground sample, divided by this capital F of S, the total number of reads total number of reads in sample S. So this is basically the fraction of reads that map to the CRE multiplied by the typical, the median number of total reads across all samples. That's this F tilde plus one, take a log and now subtract the background. So this is in the background sample for sample S, how many background reads map to the CRE? divided by the total number of reads in sample S, again, multiplied by the same median total plus one. All right. Now, for chipset data, this background here is taken either from input DNA that the user defines, so that's the best case scenario, the user, uh, I see these thing, things that I'm putting my thumbs up, maybe I should do like this. Um, so either the background samples are provided by the user, that's the best case, if the user doesn't have background uh, samples, we have some pre-processed reference background uh, DNA from chipset samples, then we use one of those. And importantly, if this is DNA accessibility data, so either ATAC-seq or DNA-seq, um, then there is no such thing as a background because the data, the, the, there is no chip signal, it's just cuts of the DNA where it's accessible. And then we simply use a uniform distribution for this background, okay? So the background basically plays no role for the autoxy communities. Okay, so this gives us a matrix of how active is each CRE in each sample. 
<clears throat> All right, then the, the next step is that we now want to predict binding sites for the transcription factors in each CRE. Okay, so we basically use the same uh, methods as I showed you before. So we have this curated set of regulatory motifs. And now we go one CRE at a time, take the sequence of the CRE and predict binding sites for all the transcription factors in there. So importantly, right? So in the MARA that I showed previously, we made binding site predictions in promoters. And given that the set of promoters is just fixed and always the same, we've made this annotation once and we use those binding site predictions for all data coming from that organism. In CREMA, we actually make binding site predictions specifically for each data set because where we're gonna find CREs in the genome is a function of the data set. And so where we predict binding sites is given by the data set. We only predict binding sites in the CREs of that data set, okay? So this is again summarized in a, in a side count matrix where now the, the rows are CREs, the columns are again the motifs. And so we maybe have 100,000 rows and 500 columns. And the, the entries are the sum of the posterior of the number of binding sites for each motif in each series. All right. And so then finally, um, the MARA model uh, is the same as before. So it's exactly the same model. Uh, we assume that the signal of CREC in sample S is given by a sum over all motifs, how many binding sites there are in CREC for motif M, what is the activity of motif M in sample S, and then plus some sample and, uh, C, uh, and CRE depends in constants. And then basically we're fitting uh, these activities to best predict this signal. We again use a Gaussian prior. And in this case, we use cross-validation to set the parameter of, of the prior. And the meaning of this motif activity is the predicted effect of removing one binding site for motif M on the signal of the CRE in sample S. Okay, that's the meaning of the uh, motif activity in S. And then again, we calculate these motif activity, these significances. We take the predicted activity divided by its error bar, square it, average it, and then take the square root. And the target scores is also the same as in the, in the previous case. We compare how well the model fits the signal across samples, either with all the sites in or removing only the binding sites for, for a, a single motif, all right? So I showed you this before, but just so for completeness, for each CRE that has predicted binding sites for motif M, so that MCM is bigger than zero, we, we in silico remove these binding sites. We sort of set this one entry in the site count matrix to zero. And now we take the log likelihood ratio of how well the model fits with the original site count matrix and with this mutated site count matrix where one binding site for one motif, uh, where the binding sites for one motif in one CRE has been removed. And so it's a measure of how well we predict the signal uh, with all the motifs versus without uh, this one motif M in this one um, CRE. All right, so now the final thing uh, that I need to, to explain is it's one thing to sort of predict the activities of CREs and to predict which transcription factors are changing the activity of, of a CRE across the samples, but it's a totally different thing <clears throat> to say which genes may now be affected by this. And as I pointed out before, we understand still quite little about uh, what determines how much a given CRE interacts with promoters in their neighborhood. And so, the only information that really that we have to go by at this point is to say uh, if, if the CRE is close to a promoter of a gene, then it's more likely to, to affect that gene than when it's far away. 
Okay, so the, the, the only sort of information that is used is the distance. And we basically have a sort of, um, so we calculate for each CRE. So here's the CRE C. And then we look at it neighborhoods, where are start sites of genes in its neighborhood? Okay, so here is uh, to the left, there is this gene 77, and it's at a certain distance from this CRE. DC to gene one. Gene two here, sec 62, it's at a certain distance DC, G2. There's a third one here to the left, there's a gene LRC31 at some distance DC, G3. And so we're now gonna assign a weight of the likelihood that this CRE affects each of these genes that depends only on these distances. And this function has this kind of a shape. This is its formula. And basically it's characterized by two characteristic distances. The distance DP is the typical size of a promoter, okay? And this is just a few hundred base pairs. So if the CRE is within a few hundred base pairs of, the, of a known transcription start site, then essentially this CRE is in the promoter of that gene. And then we're 95% certain that this CRE will affect that gene, okay? So CREs that are so close that they're essentially overlapping the promoter of a gene, we're almost certain that they target them. Then there is a second length scale, which is on the order of maybe 100 kilobase, which is how far away do you typically find CREs that are distal, but are still regulating the promoter? And so there is the second weight here that if you're somewhere between one kilobase and 100 kilobase away, then there is a reasonable chance that you might affect this promoter, but you cannot be certain. And so with a 5% probability, uh, this CRE may target this promoter. Okay, so this is the model that we use. And we basically, um, we now sort of weigh this by summing uh, over all genes in the neighborhood. So we basically, we, we assign the relative probabilities of the CRE to affect neighboring genes uh, with proportional to these weights. Okay, so if there are no questions about this, uh, so this is basically explained uh, how the Crema model works and the what um, how the model is fitted. And now I'm going to show you results of Crema on some example data set and take you step by step through the results. So I would again invite you uh, to yourself also click on these example results that you can look at the, what these results look like on the website because I'm going to show you screenshots essentially of what the results look like. So the Crema webpage is crema.univas.ch. It's very similar to uh, the Ismara webpage. It basically allows you to, to upload data. And if you go to the bottom here, you again have a tab with example results. If you click on this tab, sorry, are there questions or? No? Okay. Yeah, there are some questions in the chat, so I, I, I'm reading them now. Yeah, because this is maybe also a sort of a natural point to take some questions about uh, the CREMA procedure and pipeline. Yes. Mikhail, are you going to read the questions or? Yes. So, um, okay. One question I think I answered already, uh, so it's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> my question is the method to find TF genome wide is chip seg and attack. Uh, In my previous lab, we started new method, namely MOA-seq using MNAs to study cis elements genome-wide, which is compared to attack with what more motive? Uh, I don't really understand the question. Right, so, so um, MNAs, um, okay. 
So maybe the general remark I can make about that that is maybe useful for all listeners is that um, uh, there's been a lot of investigation in experimental methods for finding accessible DNA, all right? So it's easy to sort of say, well, either the DNA is accessible or inaccessible and make it sound like it's a sort of a binary thing. But of course, the reality is more complicated, right? It's a sort of a gradual thing. Sometimes are easier to access. Sometimes some things are harder to access. And so the way this is probed experimentally is to use enzymes that essentially cut DNA, okay? And basically, uh, the more accessible the DNA is, the easier it is for the enzyme to get in and cut the DNA in that location. And so you use the density of cuts as a proxy for accessibility. But now it turns out if you use different enzymes, you'll get different answers. So DNA sec uses one enzyme, ataxic uses some other one, and there is another one, MNAs, that again uses a different profile. So my understanding, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on this, but my understanding is that MNAs is sort of even uh, uh, gets in into the small open regions between neighboring nucleosomes. So between two nucleosomes, there's a small linker region, just a few base pairs long, and MNAs is apparently able to get in there. And so when you use MNAs, you tend to cut even in regions that we would call sort of not open, you cut in the small region between the nucleosomes. And so this is often used, for example, to learn about how nucleosomes are positioned in the DNA. Whereas ataxic and DNA seq, they tend to not cut in those regions, and they only cut into larger regions that are open, and they are kind of used as a proxy for finding cis regulatory elements. But all of this is a sort of a matter of gradation. It depends on, you know, the concentration of the enzyme, how long you put it, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so this is a whole separate area of sort of how you do these, these experiments. So I think the question is sort of related to this sort of how can you use different sort of experimental protocols to look for cis regulatory elements. So basically, we're going to assume that whatever data you upload to CREMA, this is on you. And so whether that data has a good or a bad uh, correlation with where CREs are, we cannot do anything about that. Okay, we will just process the data as if it's a good marker of where CREs are in the genome. Okay, Yulin, you have a question. Hello, thank you, Eric. Um, I have a very basic question about mm -hmm. the um, the part we just you just introduced the um, the weight based on the distance between the elements and the gene. The 0.95 and five percent. Is there a reference why um the weight is like this? No. Okay, because no. when I look at this, it reminds me uh, some very famous examples in the um, chromatin architecture when people talk about the coescence. Like the most interesting story is that uh, one example, the enhancer is mm, separated from the neighbor gene so that it cannot activate this gene by this kind of coescence and the 3D structure of the chromatin. So I thought maybe this ways is kind of considering the ratio of normal cases and extreme cases, and then we come with this number, so. <laughs> no, I'm afraid to say this is really, we just pulled these numbers out of the air. But okay. So, but we do think they're reasonable numbers, obviously, right? So basically, if you see a DNA accessible region that is, let's say, within 100 base pairs or 300 base pairs of a known transcription start site, then it means you're essentially looking at the promoter, okay? If you're looking at the promoter, I feel really confident that that region uh, affects the activity of the gene. 
because I'm just looking at his promoter and that's why it's gotten a 95 here. Okay. Close yeah, in. I get it. I also think that kind if of cohesion story your, is very if, extreme. Sorry, sorry. I also think that kind of cohesion story is very extreme. That's why it makes it very famous. I just wonder like if this kind of extreme cases were also conceded. But I can totally accept it that when it's super close, most likely should be active instead of being separated by um cohesion to another topologically um uh, domain or something like that. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. We're just we, we have one function that we come up that we, we want to work on average across all genes. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. This is a probability. Thank Don't you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, Eric, another question. Uh, would it be reasonable to include on top of the distance uh, the information of, of, of the gene regulatory network once a CRAE is within the affinity of multiple genes? Don't understand that question. I don't know what it means to consider the gene regulatory network. Sorry, uh, uh, Hur, can you probably uh, turn on microphone? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, can you return back to the previous slide, please? Um, nice talk, by the way. Um, yeah, it's basically just uh, looking at this. Uh, picture now in front of me, I was wondering, since you are relying on the distance to uh, to estimate uh, the, 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 the association of the Cree with the genes, um, because it is kind of like hard to, to kind of be sure if it is a, it's a very further gene from the Cree that actually this is the, the, the association, the correct association. I was wondering if basically looking at the genes themselves, if they are within, uh, within the same pathway or if they are, have some sort of association between them, then that is a, another evidence that maybe they are upregulated together or downregulated together or they are okay. Okay. activated. Yes. Totally agree. Hor, I totally agree with you that uh, that this could be uh, mm -hmm. additional pieces of information. But I think at this point, I should make mm -hmm. very clear that this association of CRD with genes uh -huh. has very little to do with the fitting of the model or the inferences that we make. The only use of this association is to help the user um, basically get some idea of which genes might be regulated by each CRE. So oh. what we're going to model is the activity of the CREs. We're going to find out which transcription factors are important, in which sample certain transcription factors are active and other transcription factors are active. Those are going to be the main results that mm. we're going to, to find. But then for each transcription factor, we can have a list of all the CREs that it targets, and we feel fairly confident about that. But then, of course, users often want to see, yeah, but which genes might be affected by this? Now, as I said, that's much harder. Yeah. We currently don't really understand very well. So all we can do is give a sort of a best guess of who the genes might be that are regulated by each CRE. And that's where we use this function that we see on this slide. And this function basically says, if you're overlapping the promoter of the gene, we're fairly confident you affect this gene. If you're within up to 100 KB, there's a reasonable chance that you might affect this gene. And the mm -hmm. closer you are, the bigger the chance that you affect it, but that's it. And all it's going to do is gonna give you for each CRE a, a, a ranked list of genes that we think might regulate, might be regulated by this. So. It is not an essential part of the fitting of the model in any way. Mm -hmm. It's just to help you interpret the results. Thank you. All right. Is there more, Mikhail? Or um... no, no. So another one I answered already. Yes. All right. So let's go and look at some example results. So if you click on the example results, so I've sort of uh, zoomed in on it here. 
you will see the various data sets, a DNA seq data set, um, uh, attack seq, and so on. I am going to use this attack seq data set to look at the results. So if you click on Kramer results, you will be seeing the results that I'm going to go look at. And so this is chromatin accessibility in a developing mouse embryo. So this is at different time points during mouse development, embryo development, and from different tissues in the mouse. And uh, this is coming from the Bing, Bing Ren lab. Uh, it's part of the ENCODE. And it's 10 different tissues, multiple time points in each tissue. All right, so if you click on this link, again, the page that you get taken to is essentially showing you a list of regulatory motifs sorted by their significance with names and so on and so on. Okay, but I want to first draw your attention to this, this uh, on the left here, this navigation tab that allows you to navigate to, to, to various results. And so one of the things is, for example, you, you get uh, some additional information first about each sample. Okay, so if you click on this sample table, you get a list of all the samples. And for each sample, it tells you what was the total number of CREs that we detected in this sample. Okay, so what, what were the number of significantly accessible DNA regions? And you see that this ranks from sort of 16,000 in this sample to 87,000 in this sample. Okay. And this tells you what was the mean density of reads in these series in these different samples. And this may be also interesting is what is the standard deviation? So how much variation was there in the accessibility uh, across different samples? And then finally, this tells you how well our model, our motif activity model, could fit this variation in signal across these CREs. And this goes from as low as 8% to uh, as high as uh, 26%. Okay, so these are sort of give you some numbers uh, about samples if you further click on this you get even more information about the crunch results how the how well it was mapped what the noise looked like and all, this, all kinds of additional results if you're interested in this but i won't discuss this uh, today then for each sample you also get a summary of what were the most significantly upregulated and the most significantly downregulated. right so here is one sample it's four brain at embryonic day 15 and a half, that's what this means. And you see that in this, the most upregulated motif was this RFXE, uh, Neuro D1, NFIA, they were all up here you see, so this is the Z score, right? So this, this thing was, let's say, 38 standard deviations uh, upregulated, whereas the most downregulated one is this guy, Tal1, which was almost 40 standard deviations down regulated. Okay, so you, you get some summary of what were the most up and down motifs in the sample. Uh, a second thing that we provide for the Crema results, which uh, is different from Ismara, we don't we ha don't have this for Ismara, is we try to give some overall structure of the results in, in simple PCA plots. So if you click on this link, um, We've basically, so the first PCA plot is basically just taking all the vectors of CRE activities in each sample, right? So in each sample, we have, let's say, we have in total 100,000 CREs. So we have 100,000 numbers of how active is each CRE. So we take this matrix of CRE activities across the samples, and we perform principal component analysis on this. And then we map the samples to the first two principal components. You see the first component captures 38%, the second 14%, and then basically the colors here correspond to different tissues and the, and the symbols cor correspond to different time points. Okay? And these, these plots can be, you know, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can take screenshots, you can do it. They're, they're interactive plots. Uh, but maybe more interesting, is we also taken the matrix of motif activities, right? So for each sample, we have fitted how active is each regulator in this sample, right? So how much is each transcriptor factor? 
contributing to DNA accessibility across the genome. And we take these vectors of motif activities and we perform a PCA on the matrix of motif activities. And again, these are the first two PCA components. We're also showing three and four, but I'm showing you here just one and two. And so principal component one captures 51% of the variance, number two, almost 21%. So more than 70% of all the variance is already captured by these first two principal components. And in the plot, We've also shown some of the key motifs that have a lot of projection on these principal directions. So you see that, you know, to the, to the right here, the activities of GATA 6, GATA 4, and TAL 1 go up. To the left here, Neuro D1 goes up. And to the top here, these TAIAT 3 and TAIAT 4 transcriptor factors become more active. And uh, again, so the, the, the colors are what tissue and the symbols are what the uh, time point. And it's maybe kind of fun to notice that it looks like, um, you know, different tissues are different branches in this plot. And as you go through time, you go from being closer to the center to moving sort of radially outward, right? So here, this is like liver, and this is the earliest time point and the, and the latest time point is over here. So it's like as the liver matures, you move out of the center to here. This is the forebrain. Again, this is the earliest time point. This is the latest time point. You kind of, you move out like this in, uh, I don't, this is maybe, I forget what the green is, but see, again, you move from here, you move out like that. Uh, the same here, you move out like that. So it seems like during the development, the basically the accessibility patterns become more and more different. So they're more the same originally, and then they move away to, to patterns that are specific for particular tissues. All right, so for any data set that's uploaded, we make PCA plots like that, that you can explore to look at the sort of the general structure in the data. All right, then, and this is similar to what you have in, uh, in Mara, you get a list, of all the regulatory motifs sorted by their uh, significance. So at the top of this list, there is this tall one. It has a Z value of almost 44. This is its profiles across the sample. So this is its uh, uh, logo of the sequences it binds. And for illustrative purposes, I'm gonna focus now on this RFX motif. So this is a motif that is associated with three transcription factors, RFX3, RFX1, and RFX4. And uh, so I'm gonna click on this and show you what are the results. All right, so at the top of this page, you get the Z value, it's 31 standard deviations on average away from zero. These are the three factors with their motifs. You see that they're indeed binding to very similar sites, very similar motifs. These are links towards the what's you know information about these these three genes. All right. So the next thing I think this is really one of the sort of most uh, confusing and subtle issues. And so let me try to take a minute to try to explain this. Now remember when we were doing Mara, we had expression data. And so the nice thing we could do is we could take the motif activity of some regulator and compare it with its mRNA expression of the regulator itself to see whether it correlates and it's an activator or it anti-correlates, it's, it's a suppressor. And when there were different candidates, we could ask which of these candidate transcription factor correlates best with the motif activity because then that's the one who's probably doing the regulation. But here we don't have expression data, right? We only have this accessibility across the genome. So how are we going to say whether it's RFX4 or 3 or 1 that is being responsible for this regulation. So what we decided to do is we said, let's look at where the promoters are of the genes of RX, RFX4, 3, and 1 on the genome. And let's look in the neighborhood of the promoters of RFX4, 3, and 1, and look for CREs that occur near the, these promoters and measure how well the, act, the signal at those CREs, right? How the accessibility is going up and down across samples correlates 
with how the motif activity of this motif goes up and down across the surface. And so that's in this table here. And so, for example, so you see here that there is a number of CREs that are near the, the, T, the transcription start site of RFX4 gene, right? So this one is only 146 base pairs away. This one's 695. And these ones are no longer in the promoter, but they're also relatively close. And then these Pearson correlations here that are all very high show you that the activity of these CREs, right, their accessibility across the samples is highly correlated with the motif activity of RFX4. Right? So if you look at some sort of one example, this is the one that is really right at the transcription start site. The motif activity correlates very well with the accessibility of the CRE. And so this gives you some confidence that indeed this RFX4 is responsible uh, for the um, for the regulating the activity across the samples. Okay. And uh, you can click on this link, you get taken to the promoter. So I'm just showing you to give you an idea of what this looks like. So here is the known promoter of RFX4. In these little uh, sand color boxes are all the CREs that are within this. This is a 10 KB window on the genome. So these are all the CREs. This is the one that was at 146, but there are other ones nearby. There are also some ones downstream. Here, there is a link RNA. This is a non-coding RNA that is inside the RFX4 intron. Maybe it's associated with these CREs. We can only guess. And then here you see what is sort of the average activity of these CREs. And here is the variation in the activity. So you see that the one that's at the promoter, it's also the most variable one, okay? And this one correlated very, very well with the motif activity of RFX4. So we can feel fairly confident that uh, the RFO, uh, that the motif activity is driven here by RFX4. All right, so now what does this activity look like across the samples? So remember, we here have samples from different tissues and from different time points. So we've sorted them here by tissue and then for each tissue by time point. And so if you look at this plot, you will see that this motif is most active within brain samples. So this is neural two, this is hindbrain samples, this is forebrain samples, and the activity of this motif is going up with time. So it apparently causes in these neural tissues regions with binding sites for this RFX4 motif become more accessible as time increases along with development. And in forebrain, especially, it shoots up with the last time. Okay. Then, like uh, for uh, in the Mara, we have a list of target sites, target CREs of each uh, regulator. So for this RFX motif, this these are the top targets. They tell you where is this CRE on the genome and what is the top associated gene. Okay, so. In this case, for this CRE, the nearest gene start is at 24 kilobase away. Okay, so that, that's the one who gets the highest probability. And uh, the target score is 191. So the log likelihood ratio of the model with and without this interaction is uh, e to the power 191. Okay, so these tables, again, you can search for genes, you can change the number of entries, you can sort it in various ways and so on. Um, and then we also provide kind of a summary that gives you an idea of how many CREs a given motif targets. So if you scroll down for this RFX4, you will see this picture. And so what we've done is we've ranked all the targets by their score, right? So 191, 185, 179, and so on. And we basically counted as a function of this target score how many CREs are there that have at least this target score? And so that's this red curve. And so for example, this point here at 100 means that there are 100 CREs we have a target score of at least 80 or more. Okay, so you get an idea 
of sort of how many targets there are with, with a high score of being targeted. And in the blue in the bottom, it shows you what this distribution is when I look across all motifs. So you see that this is really a very significant motif because it has many more strong targets than you would typically get. Okay, so this gives you an idea of sort of how many confident targets can be assigned. Now, of course, we can also look for each CRE, whether these targets are near a promoter of a gene or whether they're very far away from a gene. Okay, so we make a histogram of what is the distance between each CRE and nearest TSSs that it's associated with. And so you see that for this RFX motif, there is a moderate amount of targets that are at less than one kilo base from the CRE. And so these are near the promoter, but the main hump is at, uh, at distal regulatory elements where the nearest TSS is, is somewhere at uh, 10, 20, 30 kilobases away. Um, another picture of where you find the CREs for this particular motif RFX is to say, well, how many of these CREs lie in a promoter, in an intergenic region, in the exon of a gene, or the intron of a gene, and then say, uh, so that's what's in this uh, pie chart. You see what fraction. So we see that 34% of the CREs lie in intergenic region, 39% in introns, 21% in promoters, and then only a small section overlaps either exons or introns of genes. And we can now compare these numbers with, first of all, if I were to just pick random points in the genome, how enriched are various categories relative to random. And then you see that relative to random, promoters are enormously enriched. And so are introns are also reasonably uh, enriched. Uh, and a maybe even more informative one is saying, if I compare it not with the random positions in the genome, but I compare it with all other CREs, right? Because this is the CREs targeted by RFX. So now I can compare that with all other CREs what are the fractions falling in introns, promoters, exons, and so on? And then you see that actually lots of other CREs have more sites and promoters that they target. And, uh, and the CREs of RFX are actually mostly enriched for intergenic and a little bit enriched for introns. Okay, so it gets you some idea whether the targets of this motif are CREs that are mostly distal or mostly at promoters or mostly in introns. All right, so here's just another example motif. This motif is called MEF2B. And uh, MEF2B, there is no TSS uh, near it. So, I, I, sorry, the prom there are no CREs near uh, MEF2B. So the closest, uh, actually this one is nearby, but it doesn't correlate. Sorry, I said something wrong. Um, what you see is that this MEF2B is particularly is only active in heart tissue, and it becomes more active over the development of heart, and uh, this is uh, uh, associated with uh, targeting muscle genes. So if you look at the targets of uh, this MEF2B, we also, again, we, we give gene ontology categories, so we also give which ontology categories are enriched among the genes associated with the target CREs. And you see that uh, these are mainly uh, muscle genes and uh, the targets of the CREs of MEFB are mostly enriched in, in introns. Hmm. Another example, just to give you an idea about the variation that you see in uh, how active these motifs are in different places, this motif NFI seems to be active in almost every tissue and its activity is going up with time in all these tissues, right? So NFE seems to be, NFIA seems to be some general factor that is generally increasing of tish, the, the accessibility of tissue specific CREs, but across all tissues, not specific to one tissue, right? So this MEF2B was very specific for heart, but this NFI seems to be going up with the overtime in all tissues. All right. Um, 
So the final thing I wanted to show you about this is that like uh, with Mahara, all the results I show you now are basically summaries for each regulator. Where is it active? Where is it not active? What are the CREs that it targets? What kind of genes are associated with the CRE? But you might also be interested in a particular gene and might want to know what CREs are near my gene of interest and how are these CREs uh, regulated. And so again, there is a searchable list. You can click on, on the left here. And um, you will get a list of all CREs. So again, this may take a minute to load because there are so many of them. And uh, in this list is sort of the ID of the CRE. So it tells you where it is. What is the mean signal intensity? What's the standard deviation of the signal intensity? And how well does the model fit, the, the CREMA model fit the variation in the activity of the CRE? And uh, so uh, again, by default, this is sorted by FOF, but you can also for sort it by any of the other things. You can search for genes and so on. All right. And uh, so I've clicked now on the top one here. Um, and then so you see this is the accessibility of this CRE across all the samples. And in orange, again, is the predicted signal first with all the motifs turned off. And then if we turn all the motifs on, you see that actually the model very well fits the accessibility of this motif across the samples. And now again, you get a list. These are all the regulators that are predicted to target this motif and they're sorted by their target score. So this, this motif, VSX1, UMCX, no, this is bound by multiple factors has a chi-square score of 10. It has 0.7 binding sites. The Z value of this motif is six and so on. So you see this guy has also an RFX site. It has a score 9.4. And you can again turn each of these one on or off to see the effects on the predicted signal. Now I should tell you that I took this guy from the top of the list. And so again, most genes are not predicted anywhere near as well as this, but this is just show, uh, to, to show you an example. All right. So finally, um, like for Mara, we also have a, a, a list with uh, downloadable files that allow you to, to explore the results offline on your own computer. So all the HTML files with the links, they're, they're, they're all available, but also a whole bunch of flat files with results that you can use for downstream analysis. And so when I say downstream analysis, you're wondering, okay, what can I do? I just show you one or two examples to just give you an idea of what you might do. So one of the things that you could do is you'd say, well, you know what I'm going to do? is I'm going to stratify all the CREs that I have by how far they are from the nearest TSS. So here on the left, I took the T all, the, um, all the CREs that are near TSS. Here that are about you know, one to 10 kilobase, and here the ones that are more than 10 kilobase away. Okay, so these are distal, these are not at the promoter, but near a promoter, and these are at the promoter. And then we plotted the distribution of how variable is the accessibility of the CREs that are at promoters, near promoters, or far from promoters. And you see that the CREs that are far away from promoters tend to be clearly more variable than the CREs at promoters. That is to say, the accessibility at promoters varies a lot less than the accessibility at distal regulatory elements. Uh, in similar way, you could look at the variability um, um, at an earlier time point versus at later time point. Okay, so you can take all the samples at day 11.5, day 14.5 and birth, and look at the variability across CREs in the genome. And then you see that at birth, the CREs are a lot more variable than they are uh, early in the time point. Right, so these are just two examples of some analysis you can uh, do downstream where you use the results that come out of CREMA, the flat files, to, to make these kind of plots yourself. 
later on. All right, so uh, that was already, I mean, there's a lot more one could say, but that was basically what I wanted to tell you about Crema. So uh, again, this is a picture of the website and um, Crema used work of lots of people. Uh, so the main developer was uh, Anna uh, with the help of Mikhail, but it, uh, as you saw, it also heavily used this crunch pipeline for chipsec analysis that was first developed by Severin Berger with the help of Said and uh, Phil Arnold again developed the method for predicting these binding sites and Nick and Sylvia, they both also helped with the, the various steps in the pipeline associated with the pre-processing of the data. All right, so with that, I'm uh, done with the presentation.